Welcome, Sojourners. You have found yourself a cozy place in Sojourners Awake. I'm Jonathan, and this is our production of The Bookish and the Brave. Like you, the Sojourners are on a mission. They face conflict, sometimes even danger. Nothing good comes from this world while darkness reigns, and in this most recent production, the Sojourners prepare to assemble their graduation speeches and to start their very own lives as bookends. Now, what being a bookend entails, well, that still remains to be a mystery, though there does appear to be some threat of death. You will find the Sojourners moving in and around Bald Top Library, meeting interesting characters, and going on their very first mission in this session. And so for now, our story continues. After one solid year of study at the library, the bookends finally stood among the witnesses and the lights of graduation. While still in the order of the Cloverblade, Vaughn had become well known and respected within his rank of the Bald Top Brothers. Hawkins, having spent most of his time at the Helping Hands workshop, still garnered attention as one of the idle hands. Sterling spent most of his year in solitary study until Sylvia, the elven woman, met him and decided she simply must invest in his well being and training. Now, before the class, the bookends obtained two titles one as a witness donning their purple robes, and one titled as The Bookends. A hush stifles the applause. Their indigo robes are now placed upon each of them by Skoda Bookworm, and he speaks. Witnesses, wardens, and wanderers, let me bring to your remembrance our first keeper in long history. He decided to open the doors to all manners of seekers here at Bald Top. And while his generosity was far, his foolishness went farther. Along with the seekers, the library's open doors attracted any sort of vermin who would seek to sully the truth of the universe. After suffering such undue pressure, he partnered with none other than a dragon of silver color and her name was Miria. Together they built up the defense binding each other in an oath to protect Bald Top's information and treasure. It was the silver dragon who established the bookends and the keeper who made her swear an oath to maintain this order. To this day, she only exists as a spirit within these hallowed walls. But the bookends live on. And now added to the ranks are Vaughn, Sterling, and Hawkins' idle hands. Everyone begins to applaud and cheer, and all eyes are upon you as you one by one take your stand for your opening speech for the first time as a bookend. Vaughn, you are first in line. My fellow participants at the Ball Top Library, I am grateful for the last year I've spent here with you. You have become my family, and I am excited to continue on this journey with you. I am grateful for the honor of becoming a bookend, and I hope that my hard work has shown itself to you and that I have proven myself worthy of this opportunity. I want to thank Sigurd for training me, not only on this, and he pulls out a short sword, but also on the long sword and the long bow, which I hope to use soon to defend Ball Top Library. I want to thank Phineas and the other dwarves for taking me in and giving me work and teaching me consling gone, the Dwarven Grit. I hope that I have proved myself worthy to you as well. To the rest of you, I hope you find me a faithful brother and that I serve you well. 
as we protect the knowledge of Baltop Library. Everyone begins to applaud and Skoda wraps up your speech. Yes, this is a place where you will find loyalty and fealty, of course. He motions towards you, Sterling, as you are next in line. Sterling uh, stands up. Uh, he's shuffling a little bit. He's not used to being in the spotlight. Uh, he's quite charismatic, but he's not um, used to uh, being in the center stage. Um, and with that, he starts stuttering. Uh, 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 well, well said, Vaughn. Um, uh, yes, Vaughn. Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a fast year. It's gone quite quickly. Um, I've le I learned a lot, and I I'm looking forward to, um, to 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 going into the library and, and seeing what's there. Um, so thank you to everyone who has taught me and uh, helped me uh, so much. Um, yes, to Sigurd. Uh, sorry, I couldn't do all the things you asked me to do. Uh, I tried. Um, to uh, Sylvia, um, thank you for looking after me and teaching me so much and um, showing me elven ways. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited to, to begin this process of um, being a bookend um, and having access to the library. It uh, really is great to be a part of something bigger than myself uh, that seeks to preserve knowledge and wisdom and all things that bring us all together in, in unity. And so thank you for the opportunity. I hope to do you proud. Everyone begins applauding and Sylvia stands up taller than all of them front row center stage and begins clapping and looking around very proud basking in the glow of her human project very much a success. Skoda kind of pats you on the shoulder and says hey well well at least hopefully your actions speak much clearer than your words but um, we do appreciate the forward nature of Sterling. And um, you catch a couple of the witnesses just kind of nodding at you, speaking the truth as like, of course, this is the reason we become witnesses is to gain access to the library. Sometimes you've heard over and over at Baltop the speakings of dedication and loyalty to the preservation of truth can be so high minded and ideal that it's beyond practical grasp, where it's so much easier sometimes just to grab a simple book. In fact, Hawkins, as you begin to take your stand, you notice a couple of the witnesses are actually thumbing through their books instead of paying attention to the speakers. Skoda motions for you to take the stand. And uh, of course, there's a little stool that's placed alongside to give you ample height. Hawkins steps up to the podium and has very similar body language to what Sterling was showing. He's makes himself small, even though he's already small. Um, and he has note cards that he pulls out of a pocket and he basically doesn't look up at the note cards from the note cards uh, for the beginning of the speech, at least. He says, uh, thank you all for uh, the opportunity to study and to train here. Uh, I I've learned a lot and refined my skills in the time uh, that I've been here. I'd like to acknowledge my friends and my co-workers um, at, at Helping Hands, especially Old Whiskers and Leilana for being good friends to me and for treating me like their family. I suppose I ought to acknowledge my parents too. Obviously they've had a lot to do with my experience here at Ball Top but I'm looking forward to a time when I no longer live in their shadow, but I cast a shadow of my own. These gentlemen who are receiving their indigo robes alongside me are enigm enigmatic uh, men, but good. Uh, within just three days of meeting them, and I'm sure many of you have, have heard this story already, they saved my life two times and would barely receive my thanks. I suspect that these are perfect characteristics for bookends to have. I don't know what dangers are out there in the world, but I know that as long as we actually stay together, he looks up from his cards and over at the other two, giving them a meaningful look, we'll be just fine. 
and so I will strive to be more like them in my service as a bookend. I will continue to pursue knowledge and skill and innovation and, and use these things to better serve. I will defend the people and the things that hold knowledge and understanding and wisdom, and I'll put my every resource to that task. I, I value you and I value the things that you value. And so I will do my best to demonstrate that, um, even if that means putting myself between you and the danger. I'm thankful for this opportunity to be a bookend and I accept it with gratitude and with grit. Thank you. There is a gentle moment of silence that is immediately interrupted with unanimous thunderous applause. And as you leave, Skoda says, well, I do think we have our nomination coming up for Master Reader. And well, son, well said, Idle Hands. Well said. Um, you have definitely garnered the attention of some of the higher master readers. Uh, some of the chanters in blue and the masters in green. And there's a couple of emissaries here that are just nodding in approval at the eloquence that this idle hand spoke so clearly, the mission of Baltop Library. There's plenty of celebration and refreshments after the graduation. But soon enough, you were all outside in the court of air standing before the emerald door and in a in a some sort of procession you begin where you first started this journey outside bald top library once again you see the sun high in the sky the waves crashing upon the volcanic rock and you see the large alabaster walls from the outside and all of the graduates, including yourself as a bookend taking up the tail line, are getting ready to walk through the doors and eventually break through the barrier of the Emerald Door, finally gaining access into the library. Now, as you're back out here, uh, Vaughn, what are some things that you're paying attention to? Vaughn is watching the other people and um, mostly watching Sterling and Hawkins and uh, and kind of vicariously finding the joy that they have, knowing that they're going to get in there and be with the books, even though it's not all that important to him. Uh, so he's he's just kind of, uh, he's feeding off the energy of everybody else who's eagerly anticipating getting in there. And he's curious. He wants to see what's on, what, what it looks like and how it is, but uh, the uh, the knowledge and such is not as motivating to him as it is to others. So he's watching the other folks and uh, just trying to uh, trying to feel their joy and uh, and participate in it with them. Sterling. So Sterling is uh, just talking with Hawkins. Uh, he is um, appreciating that. Hey, hey, yeah, that was a good word when you said uh, that Vaughn, as long as we stick together, because that last fight, he was actually there at the beginning and he did really well. Uh, so maybe if we keep him by our side, it, we might learn out better for us. So good call. Yeah, I noticed a pretty bad pattern we have so far. I agree that uh, sticking together does seem to be the best. Nobody was laying on the ground during this fight. Well, no, none, none of us anyways. I, I couldn't see if they were, so it's okay. <laughs> Can you believe it? It's going to happen. We're going to go through these doors. Ah, oh, I can't believe it. And Hawkins. Talking to Sterling has helped him to calm down. His nerves were still real high after the speech. Even several minutes later, he was still stomach still tied in knots. Um, but having this conversation as they're proceeding through the courtyard is, is really helping calm him down. And he is actually looking forward to and getting excited about um, going in through these doors he's uh curious to see how it is that they're uh secure maybe he's noted this before but how is it that people who aren't allowed in are kept out yeah you've gotten quite accustomed to seeing people turned away and it's it's simply enough mages and even sometimes archmages at the front door 
Of course, you can now read the magical sigils that are only activated by sunlight. It would take quite a mighty spell to open those up after nightfall. And then during the daytime, it's always usually about four or five witnesses, a couple mages, and then at any given call, the archmages can show up with some pretty high level spell slots to defend Bald Top Library. That being said, you remember that bookend uh, Skoda Bookworm mentioned Miriam, the Silver Dragon. And though she's never been called upon to defend Bald Top Library, one of her missions was to defend Bald Top in the time of need. As you're preparing to cross the front door into Bald Top Library, an old woman, plump, holding up a staff large strings and bells and furs attached to it with large curly hair she pulls to the side and eyes you menacingly begins to point randomly at some of the witnesses occasionally her eyes meeting yours the fall of Taverna I foresee it the region and kingdom of Taferna will fall, beginning with Boshan. Next, Greenfield and Highkeep. The sins of the Elithria tribe will come to fruition. She begins to stand up now, drawing a lot more attention to herself, insisting that her voice is heard. For a family not caring for their own is not fit to care for ours. She begins to slam her staff upon the ground in a rhythmic fashion. Uh, Sterling, you see that she is indeed casting a spell, prophesying. Their judgment has come. Alethria's judgment has come. At that point, a couple archmages approach and begin to cast spells on her, holding her in place. You see her body begin stiffening up against her will, though she is still crying out. They begin to lift her up off the ground, pulling her in a direction away from the rest of the witnesses. The Elithria tribe, their sins have come to fruition. A family that does not care for their own is not. And finally, an archmage douses out her lights. She collapses unconscious though her body is still suspended in the air. Kalan, the gatekeeper, um, let us continue the procession. Please, please, let's keep everything moving on. How do each of you respond to this situation? Hawken turns to uh, Sterling. That was kind of strange. I, I mean, I don't think she's... I think we kind of know that things are going down, but... Was she casting a spell or something? That looked that that was just weird. Yeah, she, she was. She was um, she was doing something. Uh, I, I, what did she say? With Greenfields, High Keep. She said they're all gonna fall. I wonder if anyone knows her. None of you have ever seen her before. And then you hear a student speak up and says, "Ah, uh, she was here maybe last year, about doing the same thing, same." Prophecy, prophesied Boshan would fall, prophesied. I mean, but you know, you, Boshan kind of had it coming. I mean, I, y'all could probably speak better to that than anyone else could, but I mean, <laughs> what a broken clock is right at least twice a day, right? I mean, she can't possibly be right about Greenfield and High Keep. Those places are a little more honest than Boshan. I mean, the noble classes and the noble families, they were terrible, extorting the people, oppressing them, making them work so hard. I mean, I, the steeple bottoms, everyone were just, it was an awful situation. I don't think they were all awful, my friend. But yes, there were some bad ones. Given your tone of voice and your quick retort, the young man is silenced. As soon as he sees your indigo robes, he declines his rebuttal. You are led through the procession as well, and finally the emerald door Though it is a large 15 to 20 foot high door, there's a simple entryway that you can move through like a keyhole. Skoda is there welcoming all the witnesses. And finally, he says, Wilkins, I'm glad you're here. 
Never before have we ever needed a defense. For knowledge, wisdom, and truth, please enter. He bows and steps forward. Thank you. Hawkins, the first thing you notice as you walk through, it's a miniature city within the citadel. Instantly, there are small little huts, cobblestone roads that lead uphill. And each between the houses, there are large stone towers that spread all the way up to the sky, shooting like candles upon a cake. Stairways go up and up to buildings shaped like mountains with doors springing from all sides like a busy bed of ants witnesses and readers and master readers move from one location to the other transferring information you can literally see books being written before your very eyes as scribes stand there in a moment of inspiration jotting down with all their might and memory for eight to 12 to 16 hours at a time transcribing spells and lore and wisdom all of a sudden vaughn a student uh, a witness goes flying through the air nearly knocking your head on a broom and the student zooms up and down and does a double back flip and kind of gives you a wink and a nod clearly pleased with her impression her impressionable flying skills You see a couple of strange human-like creatures that you've never seen before with their green spotted skin, nearly completely flat faces and extra large ears, very proud black stringy hair tied up in large knots and impressive overly stuffed robes. These Githyanki and Githrzai, travelers of far plains, walk up and down with you, examining the edifices, storing all of the knowledge, truth, and wisdom of the world of Banzaro. You can feel the life and the vibrancy of information being transferred even as you speak. As you're moving through this mecca of data and information, The playground is yours as you are free to move about. And Skoda merely looks at you like Willy Wonka welcoming a child into his candy factory and just begins to laugh at the various responses. Some students, their knees just knocking together. One young lady just passes right out at the overwhelming amount of information. One student just runs and chases after uh, someone whom he perceives to be a god in the flesh begging and tugging at the robe, begging for an autograph or a moment of inspiration. And each of you are awarded a response on your own. Uh, Vaughn is... Vaughn's not sure about it. So he's... He's kind of quiet. He's just taking it all in. He's watching the girl that flew by his head and he's he's taking in all the other folks. He's keeping an eye on Hawkins and Sterling and and uh, seeing how they're responding to the whole situation. Um, yeah, he's, he's pretty quiet. I don't think he's doing much. Does Vaughn appear at this moment somewhat underwhelmed? Yeah, maybe, maybe a hair. Possibly then Hawkins and Sterling, you may notice this on your companion's face. Sterling, how do you appear? <laughs> so Sterling is kid in a candy shop, wide-eyed, we're like looking where everything is, um, just uh, kind of uh, taking note of uh, what kind of system they use to store books. Like, what if there's like, this is for this, this is for this, this is for this. Um, he is looking at the people who are involved, look at the learning that's going on, and reading their faces as they are, um, you know, wrapped up. But he is, yeah, not paying attention to the two guys around him. He is now uh, where he wanted to be. Hawkins is is a little bit overwhelmed um he's kind of stunned into place and uh after a moment vaughn's words come to his mind 
to uh, that the, the fastest way between any two places is in a straight line. So he starts looking up at the buildings and figuring out, like thinking, okay, if I'm here and I need to get there, how am I going to do that? He starts that kind of analysis. Mm. And obviously there's way too much for him to process. Um, so he, he takes a moment to look at the other guys to make sure that they're thinking along the same lines as him. Um, he sees, he, he thinks Sterling probably is, but, uh, you know, sees kind of a weird expression on Vaughn's face. Hey, Vaughn, are you, uh, are you looking at what, uh, at how to get from place to place here? You don't seem to be paying a whole lot of attention to what's going on. I mean, I, I mean, you're, you're seeing things. I'm, I'm not trying to say you're not doing anything, but. How do you, how would you get from there to there? Well, I would, I would just run. And Vaughn, what you see Hawkins pointing to is this large cylindrical spire with multiple windows, a small door leading to a spiral staircase that goes all the way up this lighthouse right in the middle of the city. I, I, mean, I suppose I don't have a broom like that girl who almost hit me. And she spins right back around, coming towards you, and then just blows through the streets, yelling the whole way, her hair just completely undone, just flying in the wind. I know we are supposed to be here, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure what to think at this point. I would, I would trust my skills, and uh, I will learn more as we go. The witnesses begin to go to their various locations, and as you move, start to move away into the city, Kalan, the gate warden, stops you and says, A moment with the bookends. Follow me. Kalan, with a grave expression on his face, leads you up to one of the cylindrical towers. And as you're moving up the staircases, uh, there are little buttons that are being pressed upon the staircase, moving the stair up in a spiral fashion so that no one has to take a step. I can simply stand in place, continuing to read and write while moving up the stairwell. Finally, he stops at one of the one of the upper levels, pauses for a minute, puts his hand on the door and opens. Inside this room, you see a small table, a chair turned over, a man lying dead on the floor. Upon the desk, a book. And all along the walls, rows and rows of bookshelves, candles, and various snacks and rations to keep the witnesses nourished during their studies. There is a small window that is letting light in to the room. Kalan sighs and says, this is as much as we know. I'll leave it to you to solve. Report to me when you're done. And he goes to close the door. Vaughn immediately goes over to the window mm -hmm. and looks to see where it leads to and what could possibly be on the other side of the window. At yeah, at this window you can see that it is facing the court of air, so you can see all the eastern road that leads back to Boshan. Sterling will go to the guy on the ground and kind of start looking over him, see if he sees any cuts any bruises anything like external that would lead to his death or and then also look at what his face looks like upon death no cuts no bruises no really sign of a struggle his body very relaxed but his skin appears very dehydrated his face frozen in terror Hawkins goes to the door um, to see if there's any indication that it's been forcefully opened or anything like that. As you study the bolt, the latch, the hook, you notice that there are no uh, signs of forcible entry. So hey, Hawkins, what, what was he reading? Hawkins will go check it out. Now, Hawkins, as you look, it has no particular title. Gold borders along the edge of the book, a black tome, and stands just with no markings, no title, nothing particular on the cover. 
You know books like this that usually don't have a cover indicates that the author did not want the book to be judged before opening it. Sterling will ask Hawkins, um, hey Hawkins, when when the boy was being robbed of his vitality by those things that we fought, what, what did he look like? What did his, like his, did his skin change? Did he look any different? He looked cold, mostly. I, I don't know that they were necessarily taking his life like this guy. I think they were just making him real, real cold. This book is kind of strange. I mean, I know books without titles exist and, and you know, there's reasons for that and all, but it seems like the library would want to kind of have an index of, of all the information that it had. So an untitled book does stand out a bit, I guess. Maybe that's something we could ask. What does the book seem to be about? Uh, I will let you make a history. Let's do a history check. Okay. And Sterling will say, I hope it's not so terrifying that it killed him. Ten. Ten. It is most likely uh, got a title on the inside, along with information on the inside, but oftentimes these books will remain disguised, camouflaged for a reason, usually containing some kind of uh, dangerous information. It's got something kind of dangerous inside it. I don't know that it, I don't know that I could really make much sense of it without spending some time at it. I wonder if there are any other witnesses that have been around uh, recently that would know anything about the other books in here or uh, a little bit more about this man. Does the, uh, like the amount of food, does that seem to indicate that there was more than one person in here or maybe the amount of wrappers laying around? <laughs> it's an appropriate amount for one person. Okay. Good questions. I didn't see anything out the window that seemed unusual just looks out over the uh, the courtyard. Does anyone know how long it would take for a human male to dehydrate? You can make a medicine check, Sterling. It's a 14. A 14. Given the amount of time that he has been here, he was dehydrated far too quickly. Almost immediately. You can tell that this young man has barely been dead with a couple hours, though his body is beginning to fade like a husk, almost like an embalming process had taken place. It seems to me that it has to be magic. I, I think you're right, unless it's some kind of weird dust or something like that. Hawkins will pick up the book carefully and take it over near the window and kind of tap it on the windowsill with the pages spread open. So if there were any dust in the pages, it would be able to fall out and hopefully him not inhale it. You hold the book by the spine upside down? Or um, I was imagining it? like holding it by the ah. top corners. Mm. Okay. Hawkins, you walk over to it and allow the dust to fall, the light glinting through the pages. Now you catch a couple of the cover pages that open up. Mazzy's sins and crimes of the universe, a dark and foreboding text of poetry, of elder evils driven mortals mad, oftentimes read for pleasure, oftentimes read to understand the minds of aberrations from beyond. But the most horrible thing that you notice is the voice in your head. I'm still hungry. And then as you open up the pages, both covers begin to sprout like wings and a large hideous face with multiple eyes stares at you through the book and lunges to bite you. Found it. <laughs> now you may roll initiative. Hey Sojourner, this is Jonathan. I hope you're enjoying this tale of the bookish and the brave. And I really hope that Vaughn, Sterling, and Hawkins make it out of this one alive. I got big plans for them. Listen, if you are a dungeon master, whether a brand new DM or a seasoned veteran, 
and you are looking for some personal one-on-one -on -one attention and guidance, then you should stop by Sojourners Awake and check out my Dungeon Master Fatigue or Products page. Maybe you need to improve your dice rolls, maybe you need to improve your knowledge of the rules of the game. Possibly you need to understand how to do better world building so that your players have a more immersive experience. And what I have found most common is most Dungeon Masters do pretty well on those two things, but they struggle with the story structure. If that's something that you would like some personal one-on-one -on -one attention, then go to Sojourners Awake, send me an email, and let's get in touch. And so for now, our story continues. You guys had a, y'all had a sneaking suspicion that some kind of foul play, as, Ma as Vaughn had said, yes, indeed, magic was the culprit. And as this magical book begins to form, it almost begins to take on a fleshy a, a body. And you begin to feel the cold, sticky, slimy flesh sticking to your hands while you're still gripping the book. The book's, uh, the book's cover begin to sprout into wings. And this creature now taking on a corporal form begins to lunge at you, but not before you, of course, Hawkins, have the first strike. Um, Hawkins will just try to get away from it. He wasn't really prepared to do any kind of attacking, so he's going to try to, you know, get his hands free of it um, and retreat across the room if he can. Okay. As you leave the presence, again, the voice still in your head, I'm still hungry. It's going to make a attack against you. And as you turn around, it grabs the nape of your neck and begins like a vampiric creature begin to siphon the energy from your body with a 21 to hit 16 necrotic damage whoa ouch and i need you to make a constitution saving throw of course you do That's 12 good uh Four. how about five five you take on one level of exhaustion okay your two sojourners see you turn around and run towards them. Your eyes go wide and this creature digs its multiple fangs into the back of your neck. Your face begins to get tight and dehydrated and your skin is stretched over your skeletal frame. And you take that point of exhaustion, which means first level of exhaustion. You have disadvantage on ability checks. Uh, you are successfully moving away though. I, what I'm going to say is that the book still is attached to your neck, so it travels with you. Okay. So you uh, may decide to move to a particular location in this square room. There's a table, there's a chair, there are rations, there's an edge wall of books, there is a door, and of course the window that you came from. Which direction do you go? Um, I think toward the door. Okay. You are able to go to the door and begin to open it and leave if you wish. I'm, I don't want to leave the room. So, I just, so you're starting I to... You're just moving towards the door. Okay. Yep. All right. Moving towards the door. Next up in the initiative, please. Sh should be me. Uh, we have both had nines, but I'm guessing that my uh, my uh, initiative is a little higher. My dexterity is higher. Yeah, right. Vaughn. Um, that was a reaction from the creature. Okay. Well, Vaughn is going to use his reaction first, and he's going to try to punch this thing off of Hawkins' neck a couple times. Go for it. High risk, high reward. Sure. All right, go for a 14 then. All right, the uh, first attack is a 20, 22. Successful. Mm -hmm. Eight points of damage. All right. And the second the second punch misses, so I'm hoping that's because it had already flown off of Hawkins' neck. What did you get for the second hit? Uh, nine. No, did not. Yeah, the second time it starts to fly away and spins around. It has a very erratic, otherworldly movement as if it um, almost uh, doesn't fly around like a typical bat or bird. It goes down when it should go up and you your hand just completely misses it. Okay. Is it, but it's still, it's still there, right? It's still there, still moving around and spinning around. But it's no longer attached to Hawkins. Nope. You okay. successfully knocked it off your partner. Good. Then I will use my regular attack to swing my sword at it. That's a 17 to hit. Indeed. For five points of damage. 13 total points of damage, your sword goes slicing through it. And as it is damaged, you notice it doesn't completely 
go through it like a ghost, but you can feel that flesh. And as that flesh slips off this creature, it begins to dissipate into mist and then drops down, forming the corner of a book. It is now the creature's turn. It goes for you, Vaughn, with a six to hit you. The creature begins to latch onto your arm and you quickly just shake it off. This this monster, this aberration, unable to take a bite out of you. Sterling, what would you like to do? So as um, Hawkins runs by him, um, and he sees now that the creature, and he sees like him look exhausted and just kind of pale, um, he'll quickly um, slap him on the back and cast Cure Wounds on him um, to make him feel a little bit better and just kind of like, you okay there? And he's going to get 12 points of HP back. That's a good slap. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You good? <laughs> you okay there? <laughs> Knock the wind out of you. <laughs> and then as a bonus action, he'll cast Shilele on his quarterstaff as he swings around with his other hand, just ready for his next turn. He was trying to try and stand in the way of the creature and Hawkins so he can catch his breath as well. This creature very close and engaged with uh, Vaughn. Hawkins, what would you like to do? Hawkins will swing his left arm up and expose these uh, the electrical ports in his arm to this thing and say shock and uh, essentially cast shocking grasp. Oh, that's a eight to hit. Yeah, does not. And this, I'm just, yeah. This, go ahead. This, this D20 is in jail now. <laughs> oh, bummer. <laughs> Hawkins, you go to reach it, and the shot goes off prematurely, and just uh, just goes off into the air. And um, this creature again moving around just in a very erratic fashion. And Vaughn's got his weird, awkward grip upon it, and it's just moving around. It is now Vaughn's turn, followed by the creature. Vaughn will try to slash it again. Go for it. You're going for a 12 this time. I got a nine. Oof, man, it is moving very erratic. Going to try to punch it twice as well. 19 for seven points of damage. And the second one is a miss at an eight. Well, it's now the creature's turn. It's gonna go for Vaughn once again. That's a 21. 17 points of necrotic damage. The creature finally grabs a hold of your arm and begins siphoning it off. It begins to start dehydrating you. So make that constitution saving throw, DC 12. 18. You succeed, able to fend off this exhaustion. You shake it free as it starts to siphon off. You know exactly what's coming. You're still engaged with it. It is now Sterling's turn. So you uh, see Sterling's eyes start to flicker and he's not really looking at it. He's just got his quarterstaff uh, and he's gonna use his portent and hit it with an 18 with the shillelagh. Um, He's just kind of waiting for that perfect time when he stopped flapping his arm around and it rears up a little bit and then just swings his quarterstaff like a baseball bat. And he is going to do uh, nine points of damage. Mm. With the sign of the badger coming through the window at that moment, you can almost see the evening star begin to twinkle. Smash it. Uh, What was your hit? 19? 18 to hit. 18 to hit. So 29 points of damage. You smash it and it starts to move and it hits away from Vaughn and it goes clear across the other room and lands in the corner. It's still flapping around and you can see that it leaves behind a couple leaflets of pages that are now formed as a book. They slowly float to the ground. Anything else, Sterling? Um, Seeing that it worked and just looking at Vaughn, who's looking a little um, worse aware, he's going to use his bonus action to cast Healing Word uh, and heal Vaughn for eight points of damage. And that his weapon is no longer shallowed. Yeah. What healing word do you utter that Vaughn's find so healing? Um, it's the with the chalice overflow. The book is now clear across the other side of the room, Hawkins. Uh, so Hawkins will pull out his uh, light crossbow and take aim. That is a 17 to hit. Well done. Nine piercing damage. 
and that is enough. It's go ahead and describe, but I imagine that your the creatures in the corner of the room flapping about. You see its multiple strange eyes begin to form in the book. It sees you once again, realizing what an easy target you were. It flaps open once again, and you hear the voice in your head. I'm still hungry. It moves towards you and attacks. Hawkins says, in his mind at least, eat this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and lets the bolt fly, and basically it's a good thing it's coming right at right at him because that uh, you know less swirling around, so we got a good clean hit. Mm, fine direct line of shot, and as the bolt goes through, it sticks on the other side of the wall. The creature falls to the ground, reforming into a simple book, Mazzy's Sins of the Universe. The page slams, the cover slams shut, and you see once again the book lying next to the deceased young man. Now you can see where the man was bitten as his shirt is pulled back. There's two, three, maybe seven bite marks upon his chest where he did not succeed so well as you did. You hear footsteps coming up the stairs very quickly. Kalan and Skoda come bursting in. We heard, we heard struggle. Everything okay? It was magical. There was uh, the book bit us i don't i don't know what to it, say it, no it, it it passed the inspection it's it's a book what did something come out of the book it spoke in my mind it, it was telling me that it was hungry and then it kind of transformed from a book into something else as you can see it's it's back to a book now uh but it was kind of had wings and moved around flatty and dark Vaughn shows them his bite marks and then um, pulls pulls uh, uh, Hawkins' like tunic down just a hair to show the bite marks on the back of his neck, too. Sterling will put both his hands above his head and go, we ended that book. Yeah, so Skoda kind of looks at you a little bit. He picks up one of the leaflets. He sees where you clearly cut off a corner of the book and says, well, that's a new way to cut corners. And... Kalan looks very confused and he examines a couple of your bite marks, which now look a little bit like scars. They're not real, no real open areas. A lot like the man in Hawkins, you look pretty sickly. This is a moment of test, so I'll let it be with advantage and it can be the highest member among you, but please make a persuasion check. 17. Okay. Skoda says, actually, this this might make sense. So we acquired this young man and in walks a very sheepish man. He looks very nervous and he says, I'm Philo, Philo Reston. And what would you like to tell us, Philo? I, that's my book. I, I paid to get in here with this book. Skoda looking at each of you introspectively, Kalan now completely out of the picture. Skoda looks to you, Vaughn. Well, what do you think? I don't understand magic very well, but it looked like a book on the desk. Then Hawkins picked it up, and then the next thing I knew it was a monster biting Hawkins' neck. By Philo interrupts you. No, it, it's not a monster. It's a, I bought the book. I, I read through it. I thumbed through it. It's, a, it's a, It never t- transformed into a monster. Philo, novel. look at my neck. Look at his neck. Look at the boy <laughs> on the ground who's dead's neck. I, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with the book. That's. That, it looks like you just chopped up my book. That, that man could have died from any reason. You're just trying to frame me. You're just, you want me gone. You want me out of here. Skoda puts up his hands and then he stops for a minute and looks to three the three of you. Now, actually, Philo, no one said that you did this on purpose. I'm sure that the library has those who would try to get in by deceitful means. It could be that this book was uh, set up to activate not until it came inside the library or something like that. I could think of a few explanations. I think it's good for us all to to stay calm now, though. You seem very defensive. And I said nothing about you. I was only talking about what happened. 
He begins to look cornered, incredibly nervous. Skoda raises an eye. Intimidating right now. Vaughn's, Vaughn's yeah, not well, happy with his response. Okay, yeah, it's it's not feeling. He's not feeling great either. He's just deer in the headlights. His mouth gone dry. Skoda raises an eyebrow. If he had eyebrows, he would raise them towards your comment of being activated. And he says, "Hawkins, what do you what do you mean by that? Activated and brought here? What insight can you give?" I don't know a whole lot. I, I read a little bit about sort of the glyphs of warding and that kind of thing that that are part of the defenses of the library. And I, I don't know if this is even possible, but I suppose you could kind of do that in reverse. Or maybe there's a glyph in the book that activated when it got to the library. So when Philo was looking at it outside, it was fine. But when someone touches it in here, it's dangerous. So you I, touched yeah. it. I did. And it, hmm. it spoke to me when I touched it. Indeed. In my, what, well, what did it say? Uh, into my head, it, I don't think the other guys heard it anyways. It said, uh, I'm still hungry. I guess I guess it wasn't satisfied after, uh, well, feasting on, on this fella. Tell you what, go to room 41 in this tower. There's a couple here, and he hands you a card. This will give you access into studying. Burn through as much information you can on any kind of books that come alive or books that are hungry, anything. Everything is on the table. Research this as much as possible and see if we can isolate what this thing could possibly be. Uh, I will send someone in here to collect the remains just in case it is not quite gone yet. Might be still activated. You, of course, remove the man. Any other recommendations you would have us make? And he looks at you with a with a uh, expectation of authority. Bookins. I will keep rec- a close eye on this one. And he looks dead in that guy's eyes. Very well. He is in your custody, Vaughn. Philo's eyes get incredibly big. He looks at Bookin like the salvation that is walking outside the door. And he looks at Sterling to appeal to a more sensitive authority. I didn't. I swear, I did. I had no idea. I, I, I would never, never kill someone. Stalin kind of shrugs and is just kind of like, well, uh, the, you didn't, but the book you were carrying did. Maybe it was full when you brought it here. Maybe that's why it wasn't so hungry. Um, but either way, we'll see, huh? Realizing that he is barking up the wrong tree and feeling completely dismissed, you are now free to accomplish your tasks and mission. Philo, of course, is in your custody, Vaughn. How do you proceed, Hawkins? Every story comes to an ending, so for now we conclude. Thank you for listening, Sojourners. Your attention will not go unrewarded, and we look forward to continuing this adventure. If you enjoyed this background music and ambiance, you should check out Tabletop Audio. You can find them at www.tabletopaudio.com. And take the time to sojourn with us. For articles on playing your very own Dungeons & Dragons games, visit www.sojournersawake.com. You can also find us telling stories on Facebook and Instagram. And as always, Sojourner, may your story continue.